Yeah, we, we try not to do only market data. Because I think that um, if they're in the mode to buy or sell, they care. But what about those seven years in between on average people move? Well, I think it's even five years now, but still, how do I say relevant in their life for the next five years before they buy or sell so that they reach out to me when it's time? And so for us, it's, you know, on our consumer stuff, it's very localized, you know, here, yes, there maybe it's a little bit of real estate. Today's episode is brought to you by ZBuyer, and ZBuyer offers an unparalleled home buyer and seller lead generation service. It's made by realtors for realtors, which is kind of the cool thing. Since 2003, ZBuyer has been continually perfecting state of the art lead generation pathways. In fact, I've been using them since 2009. And ZBuyer brings motivated home buyers and sellers to you virtually. Visit zbuyer.com forward slash LCA to see how ZBuyer can help you close more deals in 2022. Lab Code Nation, we are going back down the topic of public relations. But before we do that, we are going to talk to our guest today about overcoming challenges, overcoming the, the, the just, let me just put it bluntly, the shit that happens in our lives that knock us backwards, that give us every excuse to quit, that give us every excuse to bail, and, and how you can overcome that. And listen, I know some of you are probably thinking to yourselves right now, this is hokey and it's cliche. No, no, it's definitely not. And, I, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to interview this guest today is because 2022 has been that punch in the gut year. And I'm not sure that 2023 is going to get a whole hell of a lot better. So, so many of us need to hear this positive mindset talk, this reinforcement, this, uh, you know, anything that we can do to get ourselves uh, past our limiting beliefs and the things that are knocking us backwards. And that's what where that we're going to go today. So it's going to be a combination of that. And we're going to talk about uh, some some PR things because our guest today uh, w- formally ran Success Magazine back in the Darren Hardy days through the transition to to when it was bought by by Glenn Sanford. And, and so she has helped line up the likes of the Mel Robbins, Tony Robbins, Reese Witherspoon, Joanna Gaines, I mean, she is legit, and I'm looking forward to discussing this and talking about her journey today. So welcome to the show, uh, Paige Duncan. Thanks, Jeff. I'm so thrilled to be here and to be able to share with your audience not only what I have learned um, kind of in the mindset space from learning from the greats in our industry, but also how that helped me have the mindset needed to jump and leave everything I knew behind to start a business during kind of the worst economic times that our country's seen too. I love it. I love it. And that's, that's going to, that's going to resonate with a lot of our guests. So let's start with, mm-hmm. let's start with the who, who the heck are you? I kind of already mentioned it a little bit because you go back uh-huh. 10 years with success, but predate that, like what, what got, what led you to where, where to success and then kind of walk us through to where you are today. Gosh, you know, it started many years ago when I was in college and nobody could really decide what bucket I fit in. I wasn't quite full marketing. I wasn't full business. And at that time, there was not a PR track at our business school. And so leaving um, the business school, graduating from college, I went out in the world and started my life as an entrepreneur in the beauty industry. So entrepreneurship has always been something in my blood. My parents are the complete opposite of entrepreneurship. My dad was a U.S. attorney for many years, and my mom was an IRS agent. So the common theme is government and structure in their life. And I love color and splattering things and seeing what happens. So I've always been a little bit of an anomaly to my family on um, kind of how I work. So I started a company and it failed. It failed. After two years of being open, the recession hit. It was right after 2007. And it was a very much tough lesson. And you can't just will something. You actually have to have the tools, knowledge, know-how, and to be able to execute. The operational part was just not there on the business. And nor honestly was I probably mature enough. I think that's a big thing people forget too. There's a maturity that needs to come in starting your business, 
not maturity that you need to know everything, but maturity in that you need to know you don't know everything and it's okay to learn it. And so after that failed, I went on and I decided I was like, okay, I obviously do not know everything. I need to figure out what I need to know. And I saw this job posting for Dickie's Barbecue Pit for the um, National Barbecue Franchise. And it was for a PR associate. Knew nothing about barbecue, dabbled in PR. And I was like, you know what? Let's learn. And so I jumped in headfirst into being um, their first PR hire. There were like a, three of us in the marketing department. And took this wild ride with Dickies from when they started to franchise from like 80 locations to 400 locations when I left. And as you guys know, in real estate, right, it's kind of the same when you start with one house and you have this domino effect of growth and being able to experience that taught me so many lessons that I missed in having my own company that I knew I was like, okay, this is where I want to be. I love people. I love conversation. I love connection. And it was kind of that aha moment, Jeff, if you will, of this is what I meant to do. Because so many of us, I mean, my brother was a, wanted to be a doctor. He was in medical school. My older brother wanted to be in finance. He went to business school and got his master's. Very like set paths. But for the rest of us, there's not this just linear straight path that you follow to get to your dreams and what you want to do. And so once I found that in Dickies, um, my fiance at the time, now husband, we moved to Austin. I took a job with a consumer packaged goods company and it was fine. Not my jam though, right? Like we all go through jobs where we're like, oh, I don't feel that full connection here. But at that time, when you're a broke master, you know, student, and I'm the only one working, you do what you need to do. And so, uh, and I think it's important to tell that part of the story because you know, we always just talk about our accolades and not what we've had to go through. And it was hard. It was a mentally hard time, financially very hard time. And after he got out of MBA school, I was like, okay, I now know what I want to do, but what's the outlet that I want to do it? And I, Jeff, Googled, I want to work for a magazine like every other probably friend of mine has ever dreamt in their life, right? Or so many of us see the glorious movies and all of that. But living in Dallas, there's really not a lot of options. I mean, you have your local magazines or like American Way with American Airlines, but not really in what I wanted to do. I also knew, Jeff, I needed a space to be creative. And so I met with the uh, general manager at the time, Jim McCabe at Success. And instantly I knew like, this is it. This is where I need to be. Everyone was telling me, do not go work for this magazine. I actually had another opportunity within the company to go work on like digital course path. But I was like, again, not in alignment with what I want to do. So I followed my gut. And my whole life, I've had this challenge of like listening to my gut, but then pulling back, listening to it and pulling back and not like fully executing sometimes. I was like, I'm going in again, nothing to lose, go head first into it. And because I did that, I was hired as a marketing manager and I completely changed my role within that because I went in and at that time, success was, you know, has been around for many years. It's had many different owners. It's gone through many different iterations, but I knew it could be so much more. I was like, we don't have that relationship element. Like at that time, we were doing write arounds on the cover. Like we weren't working with the stars on the cover of the magazine. I could not understand why we weren't the authority leaders in the space. Rather, we were just hoping to get what we could get. And so I just did. I, I just started building out and reaching out to people. And I remember the first person, they had Heidi Klum on the cover. And I was like, great. I'm going to reach out to their PR people and see if they'll promote. They're like, you're crazy. She's not going to do that. Because Jeff, nobody even had asked. Like we have, have such limitations of thinking, oh, they're bigger than me. So they're not going to respond to me or I'm not worthy enough to reach out to them because they are in a level far outside my own. Well, that's just really crap. It's not true. We're, this is what I tell people. We are all experts. Just some people have a bigger audience that they projected on. Mm -hmm. 
they're no different than you or I. And so that was my whole mindset going into it. And that's how we started landing. And I started getting the Chip and Joanna Gaines and the Guy Fietti's and all of what we see as the greats of the world, working with Tony Robbins on the launch of his documentary here in Dallas, working with him on the cover. And, you know, I am not someone, if you go to my social media, you will not see me posting all the pictures with all of these people, because again, I look at them as a peer to peer and not a celebrity status, if you will. And I, you know, I very much respect their work, but I also think it's important. It's the humanity piece. It's just human to human. What are we doing and interacting with? And so I really was able to charge and build out this big talent field of now people coming to us, you know, our owner at the time had a ton of great connections too, but helping him in navigating how to use those connections to have an even greater business opportunity. And so I like to kind of dub myself just a master connector. Really, that's what PR is and what I do. It's just connecting. And it's usually connecting those that don't believe they have the confidence in asking, mm -hmm. right? Because everybody can do this. It's just who has the confidence and who has truly the time and heart in wanting to do it. And so in working with so many great entrepreneurs over the years, you know, I always thought about going and starting something on my own, but again, scared. And so um, I was like, I don't really know about entrepreneurship except this one failed attempt. I don't want to go down that path again. And I was talking to the head of marketing at the time, Lauren Cannon, who's now my business partner, and things were changing within the company. It was kind of setting up that like the world is telling you now is the time to go. And so looking in, you'd be like, she's crazy. She gets to go on all these photo shoots and she gets to meet all these famous people and she gets to go all these events, but I'm not being fulfilled like in here. And so that's when I decided to take this leap of faith. And I've never, I've never believed that you leave stuff behind. You're just going on to do something better. And so that's when we founded our agency a year ago against truly not knowing anything. We just jumped in and we're very naive about it. And it's funny because Tristan was the first person I called to tell him we're starting this business. And he said that how naive you are in that continue with that. Cause once you start to learn more, your biggest blockers are what you've learned and it'll slow you down. And it's not to say don't learn and take in the amazing knowledge. It's saying that that excitement you first have in starting your business you want that to continue to push things over the finish line. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a year now. And I got to say, in doing all of this, it's been, you know, having to have a certain mindset in being able to achieve it. I love it. I love it. And it's funny because the the email that you originally sent to Tristan too about this podcast was, I'm going to put myself out there. Like, <laughs> um, honestly, as I read it, I was even thinking mm -hmm. to myself, uh, you know, I was thinking I I didn't, it didn't exude confidence. It exuded like, oh, I'm a little timid here. I'm not sure, but right. I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there. Uh, but at the same token, you had the courage to just throw it out there. And, um, and that's, I think the, the biggest takeaway from everything you just said is just simply that, like, what's the worst thing that happens if, if you don't ask, if you'd never asked the Heidi Klum's of the world, uh, you know, if she would be, you know, be, be in the magazine, You'd never would have found out. And what's what's the worst thing that can happen? They say no or ignore you. So what? Move on. Move exactly. on to the next Exactly. Exactly. That's the thing. You can't take it personal. I think yeah. that's a big, I mean, you know that everyone says it's not, it's business. It's not personal. And that's the hardest thing for us to learn. Like truly, just because they may not respond to you should not mean that that's a validation and you doing something wrong, right? Like you can't. You got to totally put that over here and go ask the next person. Yeah. It's just like, right, real estate, like in getting clients and everything. You get so many no's before that yes. And the same applies in the PR field. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And that's, I know that's totally off base of where we were going today, but I yeah, think it's, I a good, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point to bring up because, and I don't want to take it for granted because um, I know that I'm an anomaly in that regard because that's how I established a relationship with Tristan. It turns mm -hmm. out that, you know, he's super busy and, and kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of flighty away. And I think a lot of it's because of busyness, but also because mm -hmm. he's very, 
he's not an extrovert. And so mm-hmm. neurotic communication isn't something that is top is, is paramount to him. It doesn't really matter. But, but like he told me as we, as we gained a relationship was I need someone like you who's going to push me and poke me because most people will message once and then quit because, Oh, I know he's yes. busy. I'm not going to bother him. I'm the guy that's like, Hey, 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 emoji <laughs> me again, po- pointing emoji. Yeah. And, and it turns out it wasn't annoying. It was needed. And that's part of what's brought me into his life. Now we're business partners and do all kinds of things Mm -hmm. together. But, you know, there's so many different examples that you could use that so many probably people thinking here today are are that limiting belief is stopping them from growing their business because they're just Mm -hmm. afraid to ask. And many times ask the second time and the third time. I think that's the key. You got to follow up. Like, absolutely. And I'll just say this from our field of PR. I mean, journalists say you can follow up like three times is not too many times for you to follow up with me. Like, and so think about that. We all are inundated from all different forms of communication. It's going to get lost. It is just bound to happen. Especially nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I actually tell people that until they tell you to F off, keep poking them because here's the deal. And in many cases, it's just getting buried and they're just bad communicators. They don't check their Mm -hmm. email. They don't check their messages very often. And so just keep doing it because you got to catch them at the right moment. That's exactly it. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's Mm -hmm. what it is. So until, if they tell you to F off, okay, fine. You got your answer. You're never going to reach out to them again. And they also told you they're not your people. And so just, but you got to get to that point because if you walk away with nothing, there's always that unknown of what could have been. And I can't live like that. Like I, I need to be told to F off. And that mm-hmm. really happens, by the way. It's usually, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's not off. common. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's pretty awesome. I know that's like the 2%, right? If if maybe less than that. That, yeah. Yeah, maybe less than that. Mm-hmm. Well, cool. Well, it's totally off base, but I, I love <laughs> your story. That's that's phenomenal. And who who was, uh, just for my own questioning, because I, I used to follow success when it was Darren Hardy. I used to get those oh, daily yeah. email video messages. Uh-huh. That's really what mm-hmm. turned me on to him. And that was very innovative at the time. That was before the was. mainstream. Mm-hmm. Um, who was before Darren? Did you work at, before Darren? No, I think Darren was. So at that time, there the owner of the magazine, I think, had that was the first kind of publisher partnership was with Darren. And so he was the only one. And then I worked with Kendra Hall, who kind of took his place um, a a few years ago. But Darren kind of, I know, is the one that many people think of. And it's funny because people think he owns the magazine, but he was our publisher, which in magazine terms is is very different. Uh, But that meant he was the face of our brand um, and put out all the content. And I don't know if you remember during the success days, the CDs that used to get mailed out. No, I was never at that level. Okay. So it's funny because even at our, like when I was there, we have brand loyals who still ask for the Darren Hardy CD. So, Mm -hmm. and, and so it was, it was an innovative marketing space way before we have all the technology we have today. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. All right. So let's, let's, we derailed, let's get back on, on track here. Um, and let's talk about what I mentioned in, in the opener, which is, is, you know, overcoming yeah. the struggles. And so for you personally, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of a postpartum thing, right? It was after mm-hmm. having your second child and, mm-hmm. and I know many, many mothers can relate to this. And I don't want the dads or the dudes to check out here because we're talking about, you know, uh, it could be a death. It could be, it could be a loss of a job. It could be months without a paycheck. It could be a Mm -hmm. massive bill that comes. There's so many ways you can get derailed. It could be a a, a troll on social media that Mm -hmm. completely just destroys your psyche. Uh, But for you, it was postpartum and it was like a two and a half year process. And you know, coming out of COVID where so many people got derailed and Mm -hmm. now entering into and living in a year when interest rates have, have skyrocketed, like, Mm -hmm. like we haven't seen in in really most of our adult lives. And and then, and then the lack of inventory and and it's just a really tough time. We're, we're heading into a recession and, Mm -hmm. and inflation and you name it. This is relatable to everybody is the moral of my story. So tell us your story. Yeah, yeah. And I think not just moms can relate to this, but I truly, I think I'm trying to break this stigma of anxiety because so what happened is I had my child right when COVID started, like April 10th, 2020. Nobody knows how it spread. 
Nobody knows who's allowed in the hospital, like all of that fun. And so fun. we come home, yeah, fun. <laughs> and we come home from the hospital. And at that time, I had stepped back from work, right? Take my maternity leave. And six weeks in, Jeff, I just got, like, I thought I was on top of the world. I was like, oh, two kids, it's not hard. I got this. We're not letting anybody see us because it's COVID. And then it all came to me, right? Then it all hit me. And I went from, like, living life, thinking I can manage it all, to having debilitating anxiety attacks. I literally could not get out of bed for three to four hours each morning. Every morning, I'm on this hamster wheel of anxiety attack go through the day struggling anxiety attack. And for a good four weeks, I thought it was just situational. I was like, I don't know what this is. And I had never really thought about my own mental health ever. And so I, for four weeks, I tried to blame, like, I thought it was something scientific, something was wrong. So we had all these tests done. And then the problem was not getting help soon enough. I stay on this cycle and then I start the guilt trap coming in where my son, my husband's having to be the main caregiver of her children because I am so stricken with this that I can't care for them. So now we're going into six weeks of this. And finally, my husband is the one that actually intervened and found this support group and found these doctors and he set up all the meetings. He truly did not know what else to do with me. I was just a shell of myself. I like anybody going through a, such a horrific time in their lives. And it took a beautifully mixture of support and um, therapy. And truly, like for me, truly medication as well, because I was just so all imbalanced. And had I had such a control issue that it took this huge event in my life to make me give up all control. And that was the biggest lesson, Jeff, that I came from it because I couldn't control what was happening to my body. I could not control not being able to move hours each day. I couldn't go back to work. I gave up everything in my life crumbled away through this. So going from someone who is a high performer to stuck in bed, not being able to move every three to four hours each morning, someone who is like, mom front and center to not being hardly a mom at all. And then be not showing up as a wife or a daughter. Like my relationships with my siblings got so strained because they didn't know what was going on. I just wasn't available. And that was a two to three month cycle of just not being available, not being present until literally one day I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't do it anymore. And I was like, if I don't switch something and just let go of the control and follow what my husband has found for me. I'm not, I'm not going to make it through this. And I think that was the biggest lesson in me was that you can have something screaming at you saying like, let go, let it go. And you still don't do it. And so then physically it came out. When you say your husband found it for you, what was that? Yeah. So he found the, he found resources and the, the support group and a therapist to talk to. He went out and found the, he educated himself because I was not in a place to educate myself at the time. I just wasn't with the mental wherewithal. So he took it upon himself to learn what was happening to me learn what I needed to figure out who I needed to speak to. And so my husband, who I trust wholeheartedly, like he came to me one night and that was the pivotal like moment. He came to me one night and said, I don't know what else to do for you. This is all I have. And to see like on his face, the like just loss of hope. I mean, that is what the game changer was, Jeff, because when you see someone you love so dearly look like they have no hope in their eyes left right? You're Mm -hmm. like, wow, this is truly like, this is it. This is my only option. And you know, what's interesting, I will say about mental health is it's a stigma that so many think of us don't think we have to deal with. And growing up, it was kind of a stigma in our family. And I didn't ever think it was something going on in here. And had that something been more talked about or prevalent in my life, I probably would have gotten to that conclusion sooner. I just wasn't educated enough to know what was happening. 
or who I needed to speak to. Right. So many of us struggle, like we're going through grief or a loss or pain. And the hardest thing is figuring out who do I talk to and who can help me through it. Oh, well, your husband sounds like a saint. He, oh, he, he is, he (laughs) is a saint. I mean, I truly give my recovery because literally I had lost all confidence in myself and no confidence. I was not confident as a parent. I did not think I could ever go back to work. I'm like, how am I going to live with this and go back to work? You know, like I lost everything mentally and what I had built over the years. I think I think more than not nowadays that would lead couples to divorce much quicker mm-hmm. than recovery because I think most people just kind of throw their hands up in the air and say I'm doing I'm doing it all like I'm being mm-hmm. a parent and I'm supporting our family and what are you doing you're just lying in bed and you know they, with, because of that lack of understanding and lack of patience and all of the above and I'm not saying that that you're anybody would be wrong for doing that right uh, right I'm by far <laughs> not the, the authority to, to judge anyone in that regard but at the same token I think that would be the common response that's 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 powerful however it's it's um I don't know that a lot of us can relate to that and so when mm-hmm. when you when you talk when you talk about what is relatable that you can take from that that now someone can apply to one of the many examples I put out when I yeah. first mentioned this like what would be your advice to somebody because I guarantee there's somebody listening to this that is has gone through it is going through it or doesn't even realize they're going to go through something right. that's going something. to derail them yeah 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 absolutely I would say the first thing is like you if you don't know how to deal with whatever pain and grief you're going through ask for help the biggest strength that we have is like asking others around us for support, ask for love, ask for whatever your needs are. Don't diminish those needs. That's the biggest thing that I learned about it because we automatically are trained to start thinking, oh, this will pass. Oh, I should already be over this. Oh, this isn't that big of a deal, right? We already start like society minimizes like how much time we should have to go through or process grief, pain, you know, huge life change, but there's no amount of time for it. So the first thing I would say is ask for your needs. Number two is don't put, don't put a timer on it. Right. And I think that's the biggest thing. Like when I was going through my journey, I was like, Oh, I'll be better in a week. I'll be okay. Now that I am talking to a therapist, I'll be back to myself in two weeks. And it took two years. Right. Mm -hmm. And so don't time yourself on when you're supposed to be back to what you think is perfect or what you think is like how you were and don't put a timer on it. Just let yourself have that space. And then the third thing that I would say when you're going through such a moment in your life is, and this is something that my therapist taught me that I think is so, so profound yet simple is it's, it's a moment, right? So while it feels like I thought my entire life, I was going to have to live like this. So that was me living in the irrational state of it, right? The rational state is it's not going to be like this forever. I'm going to figure it out. And so the more that you can focus on what the rational things are during the time that you're going through, which is going to be so hard to do, but the more you can rationalize what really is going to happen with your outcome the more sane you're going to feel and that you're not going to have this doomsday just take over you and not give you the space to heal and the space to get back on your feet. It's fascinating. Uh, And it's something that I, I, like I said, I am far from the authority on it. I, I, um, I've been told I compartmentalize well, which means I, you know, I, which I I've learned now through time that I guess that's a good trait in terms of reacting and act, you know, when, when things happen, um, but then on the other side of the coin, sometimes I feel like because of that, uh, I'm emotionless oftentimes, oh, or that's mm-hmm. the, that's the way it's perceived. Like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, 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 we, we lost a nephew who drowned a year and a half ago and it was devastating wow. obviously. And, but my, I remember my family, my wife, who was her brother's son, uh, my daughter, my older daughters who were both adults were about like, why, why aren't you crying? Why aren't you more upset? And it was just like, and then you kind of sit back and reflect, like, I don't know, why am I not? It doesn't mean mm-hmm. I'm any less sad than you guys are. I just didn't go into a state of depression over it. And I don't cry a lot. And so it's like, mm-hmm. you learn a lot about yourself. And and I think um, 
what you're mentioning though is is so debilitating to not only marriages and families mm-hmm. but but our careers mm-hmm. and and I, I i almost feel like like the the the, the reflection your own self reflection and even even understanding who you are is such an important part of this mm-hmm. because if you can't do that mm-hmm. you can't if you can't recognize the issue then how can you ever seek treatment or seek right. improvement right right that's so true because you do have to be able to have a moment to reflect on what is happening cuz it, right it's so true Sometimes we don't even realize what is happening to ourselves because we just are moving at 100 miles per hour. Or we think, let me get busier because it's going to take my mind off of the pain. When in turn, it's actually delaying you from being able to move through it and delaying you from being able to truly like process it and sit with it, right? Because it's just masking. All we're doing is masking it on top of each other. And like to your point, Jeff, everybody deals with things in different ways we all process and there should never be a judgment oh you don't cry because i used to get that i don't my husband even says that i don't cry enough in movies like am i not emotionally connected to them i'm like i you know that's not how i process i'm not a huge crier either and so that's the thing it's like the less that we can take off our plate when we are going through something so we can actually have that time with reflection is what is going to be the biggest difference in getting back on, on your feet and i don't want to say quicker but just getting back on your feet and starting to make those baby steps towards where you want to go back to yeah i love it i love it and and i don't want to beat the dead horse here i think that's very valuable uh, for anybody listening, I think this is important. And, and, and at the end of the show, too, I think some of you may even want to connect. And so we'll make mm-hmm. sure that we give we give you a direction on doing so. But uh, I think from this topic, let's make the uh, natural segue over to PR. <laughs> it's I, true. Well, it's you know what, though? They are so fitting because in PR, it is relationships. There's tons of emotion. There's tons of, I mean, it's very relatable, Jeff. So great segue. I was totally kidding, but I'm glad that you backed me up there. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm going with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So when when you think of PR, you think of, you know, you, 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 uh, here's what I think of. I think of famous people needing a team of people to right. manage what interviews they take. Um, and maybe more in a realistic world, you think of it, and I mentioned to this off air, I think of the where where the, the media world has gone, which is as someone like myself, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, as if you have any, any kind of social media presence, you've probably received a message on Instagram saying, hey, we can get you a bunch of PR with Entrepreneur Magazine and this magazine and Forbes and blah, 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 AKA pay big money, to get your article in the magazine. And to me, I can only speak to myself. To me, that kind of diminishes it a little bit. It like makes me think, okay, how valuable is it if I have to pay for it? And maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe it's super valuable and it is a good investment. But on the other side of the coin, as you mentioned off air, and we're going to talk about, there's other ways and free ways to get yourself PR. But before you get into that, digress for a minute to kind of explain to a real estate agent, why yeah. PR is something they need because they all think marketing, 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 maybe advertising, mm-hmm. mainly, mainly mm-hmm. marketing, branding. Why do I need PR? Why does that even matter? Because PR is your story. So while the marketing efforts is what gets your story out there, PR is what's going to make that connection difference between if they go with you as a selling agent or somebody else. So PR really is just storytelling. And why that's important for a real estate agent is because the market is so competitive. I'm sure you've seen it, Jeff, like everyone with the, you know, how fast homes are selling, like everybody got their license, it seemed like, and has just inundated the market. So what's going to set you apart and also retain and keep your clients is going to be the PR relationship aspect of it. And how are you going to get more clients using your story to connect in the community and work with the media in your community to get your name out more, to become an expert in your field? Because if you're seen as like the go-to real estate person, and can provide value to your community on educating them in the real estate space, your business is only going to flourish from there. Yeah. Yeah. 
so is that is it that simple? Uh, PR is <laughs> the story. Okay, so so it is. It's the story. And why I say that? So there's a couple things I want to touch on. So. One, if anyone DMs you and asks you to pay for PR, it's not what we do. So it's like, don't pay it. It's a scam. Don't do it. Because what they're doing there is they are more than likely have some type of contributing role that they can get you in to the site. But then like Forbes Entrepreneur, they're going to take it down. So your article, so you may pay $10,000 and get this article that could only live there a month until their editors come across it and take it off their site. Ouch. So that is what I say. You don't need to go that way. There's a couple of free ways that you can go about getting PR. And especially for real estate agents, you have so many things to your benefit right now because of where the market is and the volatility and the recession. Like, Journalists are looking for content and knowledge. So your job is, if to get PR, your job is to provide a story to a journalist that they wouldn't be able to know otherwise. So they aren't real estate experts. They don't really, I mean, they're just learning from what people are sharing with them. And so the more that you can become a contributor of research, understanding knowledge to a journalist, the more likelihood you're going to get covered in the media. So Let's first break it down on a local level. So if you're looking at local, you have all your local TV news stations, magazines, newspaper. They're all looking for content. Every day they have to provide hundreds of stories, right? You can be a steward for them and provide that content. So what I recommend to everybody starting local is reaching out to the reporters in the community. You can find them on their website. Like if you go to ABC Philadelphia, all the reporters are going to be listed in their emails. Reach out to them, start a connection with them, not from a pitching perspective, but just relationship. Give them value add. Be like, hey, I thought you'd be interested in this new report on XYZ or whatever data you can pull from or story that you have. Like, just be serving. And the reason for that is because nine times out of 10, serving them with new and interesting stories and data is where a pickup will happen. And by a pickup, I mean, that's where they're going to plop you and be like, great, Jeff, do you want to come on the 7 p.m. newscast tonight? Let's talk about it. We're going to do the story segment. And so all of those are free opportunities, connecting with reporters, connecting with the newspapers, connecting with radio. And But the one caveat I will say is make sure you know who you're talking to. So if you're looking for a reporter from the news station and you pick up the fashion reporter, yet your business real estate, you're never going to hear back from this person. So you got to spend some due diligence in it. But what I will also say is not only share your research and data information, go ahead and write an article for like, like I live in Dallas. So Dallas Morning News, write a bylined article for them and say, hey, this is what I think would be of value to your audience. I would love to get insights, you know, your thoughts and insights on this story and go ahead and write the piece of content for them. And, you know, you don't have to be an exceptional writer, but even if it's a tease to it, they want to know what the story could be, right? So if it's three, like they all love the, the numbers in the titles, three ways you can um, recession proof your business, right? five ways to be prepared to sell your home during a down market, whatever that might be. Like they love the actionable steps that you can share. Then from a national level, you it's the same process. It's just a typically a long, longer lead time. Follow the reporters on Twitter, Instagram, right? Social is huge for our relationship space now. Engage with them on those platforms. Reach out to them. And again, just start relationally talking with them. This is how like PR, all those stories that you see picked up, like you said, the famous people being picked up, take the famous people away because they're in a totally different category. Then you look at all the people on Today Show, Good Morning America. You're like, how did John with the banana bread end up on the Today Show? He told his story, like just reach out. And like we were talking about earlier, you need to just start crafting those connections with them and serving them valuable content though. Don't spam. It's not to sell yourself. It's to sell the content and story that you have. It's 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 such a common message that we're 
vomiting every day. You know, Tristan and I have a, we, we, mm-hmm. we coach on social media and it's the same concept, like stop selling, come from a place yep. of value. It's, it's the same concept. And I, this is interesting that you say this because I never really thought of it that way. And, and so when you mention, first of all, finding the reporters is, mm-hmm. is there, is there a, a certain best way to go about doing that? Cause I think somebody might be thinking, okay, this how is do interesting. I find mm-hmm. Yeah. How do, how do I go find, how do I, how do I find how do I know who the reporters are that I want to target on Twitter? How do I know where to find the local mm-hmm. reporters? And then mm-hmm. that's the first question. And the second question is, um, do I spread that? So if I if I write up a, a blog or an article, whatever you want to call it, uh, because obviously I want to try to to give them content, right? So mm-hmm. they will reach out to me and then I become the authority. Mm-hmm. Should I spread that out to every reporter with every news outlet just to kind of throw shit up against a wall and see what sticks? And that's question number two. Okay. So the first one on how to find people. So local, it's very easy. Literally go to any, you're looking for an editor, producer, reporter. So remember those names, editor, producer, reporter. Any of those three are going to be the decision makers in if your content's going to get picked up or not. So For example, your local news, like I mentioned, you can go to all of your ABC, NBC, CBS, CW, um, Fox affiliates, go to their websites and click on about the team. And every time you click about the team, it is all the reporters. You're looking for someone that's covering business, trends, anything along those lines. And typically nine times out of 10, their email will be on their website. And that's where the email your capture reach out. Same thing with your no- local newspapers. Google up what I will say, like the for Dallas Morning News, Dallas Morning News editors, and it will pull up a slew of editors that work for that. Again, you're looking for business. You can look at finance, even trending news, like any of those categories. Whoever you find as an editor in those are the right people to reach out to. So on a local level. That's how you can easily organically find their information just through their website, like through their content on when you get more regional, statewide, national, it's a little bit more challenging to find the contact information. However, there are ways to find it. So there are cost effective platforms like Rocket Reach, right, or any of these sales platforms that help you find their email addresses, which I'm sure a lot of the agents may already have and may already use. You can use those same platforms to find these people's contact information. So, for example, where I would start, if you are like, I know I'm going to be on the Today Show. I want to be their go-to, like, housing trend, like, expert, blah, blah, blah. You want to Google Today Show, and you either are looking for a segment producer or a talent booker. Why the talent booker? The talent booker is the one who decides on who's going to come in and be a part of the show. A segment producer also guides the stories for each segment on the show. And so it does, you have to do a little more research. You just Google their, that name, like segment producer today show or talent producer today show. It'll pop up their name in Google. And then whatever email hack system you have, like I said, it could be Rocket Reach. There's many out there. You that way you have their name and you can search up their email very easily because nine times out of 10, all of these people on the national level do not have their emails just sitting out there. Like you're not going to just find it like, oh, I'm Jay Smith. Here's my email. You're going to need some type of like either a person who has a lot of time to mull and dig for it. Easier option is just to buy an email lookup platform. You could even go like, to the ones that are 20 bucks a month, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to find your content. But if you're really serious about finding these, because think of you have all from the national level, you have the New York Times, New York Post, Washington Post, like all at Chicago Tribune, you have tons of other opportunities. There's so many national outlets out there that it's missed, you know, opportunity if you're not going out there and doing the research. So it just as you strategize a business plan, to open your business, you should be strategizing your PR plan because you want to become the one who's leading your story rather than the media leading the story for you, right? People get frustrated. They're like, that's not 
real news. That's not what's happening. But yet they're not going in and putting themselves in to be a part of that story. Yeah. Yeah, well, I agree. And and before you answer the second part of the question, the other the other piece of this too is is when you are actually creating that content to put out. And I think for most people, it would be very local. It would be very localized. So it's uh-huh. it's a local mm-hmm. news stations, newspapers, etc. But look mm-hmm. at it this way: if if going back to what we started talking about in the beginning, you don't know if you don't ask. So it actually turned out to be a great great thing to talk about. You have nothing yeah. to lose because here's the deal. If you do take the time to write up this little blog post, if you want to call it that, whatever it is, that's the same content that even if they completely ignore you, now that creates, that's a social media post. That's a, that's a social media, it's a Absolutely. social media script. There's so many ways mm-hmm. you can use it. And, mm-hmm. and you know what, start using this stuff. And for those of you that are creating consistent content already, now maybe you should take that stuff you're already creating now repackage it and deliver it to these, to these editors and these news people, because like you said, I mean, what's going to end up happening is, is they're, they're usually looking for content They're searching and so mm-hmm. when when something hits the news wire which it will industry related every year multiple times a year who are they once you establish that relationship who's now going to become their resource you will mm-hmm. be and so now it's mm-hmm. like rates are going up i'm going to call jeff real quick and get exactly. his take. and it's like now they're giving you free publicity and free marketing because you positioned yourself correctly that's super valuable It is. And I think that's, this is what people are missing about PR, right? So like, that's the thing is because it it gets such a, you're like only famous people need their people. That's actually like a publicist who's actually kind of a business manager, like helping them with contracts and deals. You can be your own PR person. You can be your own publicist. You don't need to have like a formal training to do it. I didn't, right. I started an entrepreneurship and then went into it. And so like, I, I, real estate agents are so good at crafting connections that you guys are literally going to be the best PR people because take that same approach that you're doing in the field and just put it to the decision makers at media outlets. And one thing I will say on that is like podcasts, right? They're huge. They're everywhere. Everybody has a podcast. Never be afraid to take a podcast opportunity. I know sometimes it, as you're getting going, people are like, oh, no. I only want to be on with Tom Ferry or whoever it might be, right? Like if I don't get Tom Ferry, I'm not doing it. That's not going to get you where you want to be with your goals of exposure and attention, right? So use all of these building blocks to be able to get where you want to go on a national level. Because the more content you also do, the better refined you're going to get at your story and your angle and what you can offer. I agree. So now back to the second part of the question, yeah. which is at now, once you've, once you've established this and you're creating it, are you now sending the same message to ABC, Fox, CBS, blah, 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 blah. What I would do. So if you're like, okay, I want to do a mass communication to them. What I would suggest in that way is don't go ahead and do the full blog post. Go ahead and come up with five titles, right? Four to five titles. So like I said, recession proof your business, like how to buy a house with a high interest rate, whatever it might be, give them just the title headlines and a little bit about you and let them be able to choose the story from there. Because the problem is if you're at an entire blog post and you pitch it to all media outlets, there is a community within them and you don't want it to seem like a span. Oh, like Jennifer over at ABC got the same one that Mark over at NBC got, right? You want, in that case, you can absolutely just copy, have a template, copy, paste, but make it just the article headlines before you go into all the entire blog post. Got it. Got it. So in other words, don't do what I suggested because you might look like a spam. Don't everybody. I like that. That's that's good. That's good advice. Well, we're we're running up against the clock. So, and and I, we've we've covered a lot of great stuff, but uh, so I want to give you a chance, first of all, like. What would be like your best, you know, kind of parting thoughts or uh, mm-hmm. something to leave our audience with based on kind of everything that we've discussed today? I would say n- the first thought is whatever you have been putting off and waiting to do, just do it today. Like start today. Um, just take one action towards whatever that dream is, like one thing today, even if you have five minutes. And the second thing is remembering that your story matters as much as the person on TV story or the person next to you. Like, honestly, they're just really good storytellers, but you can be too. 
Yeah, I love that. I mean, and for those of you that know us and how we preach, I mean, that's what social mm-hmm. media is becoming all about. Like those mm-hmm. who are the best storytellers. That's why Ryan Serhant's become so famous. It, it's it's not necessarily because of the fact that he was on Million Dollar Listing. It's because he's now he's take he took that fame, which which the algorithms don't care about, by the way. They mm-hmm. don't care. He's just become really good at telling great stories through his social media and he's one example of many but he's a well-known right. name and and that's what makes you so great so this that skill set now can be applicable to so many other areas of your life pr being one of them and honestly Paige, the one thing i will say to our audience is this this is one of those areas of life and the world and business that is so underrated and so mm-hmm. underutilized that mm-hmm. so many of you look at it the same way that, ah, uh, not necessary. And that I would argue is the reason why you should look at it because it might create an opportunity for you to create and build that authority status in a different way, which isn't through social mm-hmm. media, for example. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's opportunity here and I'm really glad uh, that we had you on. So with that said, what is the best way for somebody to connect with you? They might want to connect with you on a personal level because their your story resonated. Absolutely. They might, they might want to connect with you to ask you more questions about PR or even hire you. So what's the best way for people to yeah, find Yeah, I'm happy you? to be a resource. So um, at, on Instagram, I'm at page of positivity, um, which I feel is quite fitting. And then um, feel free to shoot me an email. It's page at the ccuagency.com. Um, I'd love to just be a resource because it is like PR, why it's such a mystery is because we just make things happen. And then people are like, wait, how'd that happen? We don't necessarily always talk about the how. And I think that's what I'm trying to bring back is that humanity piece and letting people know that really anyone can, anyone can do it and everyone has access to it. I love it. And to, to clarify, it's page P-A-I-G-E. Uh-huh. Hey, so, yep. P-A-I-G-E, page oh, of positivity. I love it on Instagram. And say the email address one more time. Page at the CSU agency.com. And for CSU, it's S-I-S-U. Agency.com. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Paige, it has been a pleasure. It has been fun. I love uh, loved getting you, to Jeff. connect and chat and I uh, wish we had more time, but uh, so is the case with great conversations. It's how they always end. <laughs> it's so true, Jeff. Thanks for having me on today. Likewise. Thank you. Today's podcast is brought to you by Follow a Boss. Follow a Boss is the real estate CRM that turns every agent into a top performer. Follow a Boss is packed with features, but it's intuitive and easy to use, so agents love working with it, and it integrates with everything. Use multiple lead sources? Guess what? Follow a Boss keeps them all organized. Want to try new marketing channels? Switch website providers? Plug them right into Follow a Boss. Visit followupboss.com forward slash lab code to see how follow up boss helps you close more deals. That's follow up boss.com forward slash lab code. Lab coat agents podcasts.